Perfect. All right. Well, thanks so much, everybody, for joining us tonight and taking some time out of your evening to be here. And hello. Thanks to everybody in the future watching this recording. Um, my name is Ali Greenslade. Um, I'm the uh, Climate Engagement Coordinator and Policy Analyst here with the Métis Nation of Alberta. And welcome to our Environment and Climate Change Speaker Spotlight. Um, I've had the pleasure of hosting um, several of these over the past year, where we've heard some heard from some really fantastic Métis community members and knowledge holders talking about how traditional practices um, can, re can really be in line with sustainability and environmental stewardship. Um, and today, tonight, we are flipping, flipping the spotlight back on ourselves. Um, usually, I do a little bit of a couple of slides at the start of these to showcase a couple of projects we're working on, but we are working on lots of projects, which you will soon find out. So I wanted to, we wanted to just take some time to um, report back on all the all the stuff we're doing. All right, so um, just a little overview of how tonight is gonna go. Um, in a moment here, I'll share a prayer provided by Elder Norma Spicer, and then we will jump into the presentation um, of who we are, what we do, um, and why we do it, and also some ways that um, that folks can get involved. Um, uh, then at the end, um, at the end of each section, we'll have just a little question in the chat for you to respond to um, throughout the presentation. If you do have questions, please feel free to type them in the chat or the Q and A box. Um, and we can respond there or just we'll save them at the end for our question period. We do have about 20 minutes planned at the end for questions. So please feel free to, to jump in at the end. Um, just a note that if you, this has been recorded and um, what the recording shares is just the screen being shared and the speaker view. Um, however, if you do ask a question and jump in that will be recorded. Um, so if you don't feel like being, being in the recording just type it in the chat and we can ask it for you. Um, also, we just ask that everyone is respectful of each other and everyone's time today. Um, and this is a safe place to share and ask questions. Um, on that note, I will um, share an opening prayer curated for the session by Elder Norma Spicer. And so we can be grounded in our thinking and begin in a good way. Um, I'll also just ask while we're sharing here, if everybody can make sure they're muted. I am honored to be asked by the Métis Nation of Alberta Environment and Climate Team to begin this Spotlight series in a good way with a prayer asking the Creator to help us protect His precious gift of creation. Today, we will learn how our team strive to continue reducing our carbon footprint and the damaging effects of climate change and ultimately preserving our Métis traditional ways of living and being. Pope Francis said, as stewards of God's creation, we are called upon to make the earth a beautiful garden for the human family. When we destroy our forests, ravage our soil and pollute our seas, we betray that noble calling. Our people and communities have always had a holistic connection with the environment, learned from teachings of our ancestors passed down through the generations. Our ancestors viewed the earth as rich and bountiful and taught us that we must protect it, not only for ourselves, but also for future generations and for the countless species with which we share the planet. Please join me in prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Heavenly Father, we raise our hearts in grateful praise for all the beauty that surrounds us. We pray in gratitude and respect for the gift of God's creation, and we ask that we may learn to walk softly on this earth. We are grateful for all those who bring awareness of this suffering planet. We acknowledge that all creation is sacred, and we pray for all creatures with whom we share the earth, that, will con that they will continue to be a presence among us. Lord, grant us the wisdom to care for the earth, Help us to act now for the good of future generations and all your creatures. Deepen our gratitude 
for all you have made and awaken in us a renewed commitment to care for the earth and each other. We ask for your blessings and the courage to act urgently and wisely so that our common home may be healed and restored and all people and generations to come may delight in it. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, thank you again to Elder Norma Spicer for sharing that with us. Um, moving along, I'll pass it over to our director, Andres Palea, um, to take it from here. All right. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope people can hear me okay. Um, first, I wanted to thank Ali for hosting the whole department. Uh, thank you, Ali, for, for putting this together. And, and of course, uh, Elder Norma Spice for providing that thoughtful um, prayer to get us started in the right way. My name is Andres Vallea. Um, I've had the pleasure of working for the Métis Nation of Alberta for five and a half years. Uh, I am Director of Environment and Climate Change, um, and I really what I wanted to talk a little bit about is why we do this work, because uh, I think that's a, you know, really important question. We, we get our direction from really two key um, documents. The first one, which is uh, kind of, um, there's a visual on your left here is our climate change, our, our annual General Assembly resolution on environment and climate change passed unanimously um in peace river in 2017 which directed the metis nation of alberta government at uh implementing programs and initiatives aimed at reducing ghg emissions developing capacity uh, increasing education and awareness on climate change and creating opportunities for the metis nation government as well as metis nation of alberta citizens and then the second key piece of uh, direction came from our provincial council that is on your right side. It's our environment pillars uh, passed in 2018, uh, which directed uh, essentially our department to work to ensure that Métis citizens can practice their culture and traditions in a resilient and interconnected ecosystem supported by clean air, water, and land. And our key, uh, three key pillars there are protection of tradition and culture, reducing the impacts on the environment and community-driven involvement. So you will really see across today's presentation that a lot of our projects, initiatives, uh, aim to accomplish one or a few of these objectives. Next slide, please. So I really, where, what I'm here, like, I'm not gonna read through the whole thing. Uh, I, I think, you know, out of my department, I'm the one to stick around a little bit. Um, but it's it's been a, a bit of a journey, right? Like back in 2017, I started with the MNA. Really didn't have uh, an environment and climate change department uh, at the time. Uh, we were doing a little bit of more climate related work. Um, in 2017, our AGA resolution, environment and climate change pass, we started doing some uh, energy efficiency and renewable projects. And then around uh, 2019, we started doing some environmental monitoring work and our, our environmental monitoring initiative, a ski launched. Uh, more recently, we've launched a whole bunch of monitoring initiatives that you'll hear about uh, on fish, plants, wildlife. We also have launched uh, an indigenous protected and conserved areas initiative. And, um, and we're also building a, a large scale um, solar power plant. So uh, I didn't really wanna to touch on all this, but this just gives you a bit of an overview of the work that we do and some of the milestones that we've accomplished over the last few years. Our department itself was just formed in 2021. So we're a two year old department uh, before we were under the Department of Métis Rights and Accommodation. Um, yeah, and you'll hear more about what we're doing in, in the next few slides. So maybe we can move on to the next one, please. Yeah, and then again, so that last slide was a bit of the history, and this is a bit of an overview of what we have going on right now. So community monitoring, m and Climate Change Action Plan, plant walks, Métis Crossing Solar Project, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm actually not gonna talk about these. I just wanted to give a little bit of a visual here. Uh, the other presenters are gonna go a little bit more in depth into these initiatives. 
but again, thank you so much for attending. Uh, and I'm really excited to, to share more information. We always get uh, this question. I know in the last five and a half years that work with the MA, every opportunity that we have to, to engage our community members, sometimes they're not aware of we are, or they're not aware that we're doing this or we're doing that. Uh, so the, the objective with this is to try to fill that gap to provide some of the information firsthand and um, perhaps, you know, meet each other face to face. Uh, next slide. And uh, this is all the incredible folks that do this, this work. Uh, so they're all on your screen. Um, and maybe what I'll ask Ali so they can all be on the screen and we can do a little wave as well. Like this is all of us. Um, and so feel free to, if you see us around and at Métis Fest in, the, in, in a few weeks, as well as the AGA, which is happening in a couple of months, uh, feel free to come say hi. If you want to talk to us face to face, we'd, we'd love to, to hear your thoughts and, and share what we're doing. All right. So I'm going to pass it back to Ali now. And, and thanks again. Awesome. Thanks, Andres. Um, moving along here, um, we just have a quick question. We are curious um, if you recognize any, any faces from MA events you've been to. So you can reply in the chat. Um, there's also some like reaction emojis you can do, like thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, yeah, just wondering if, if you recognize anybody. But with that, um, I will pass it over to our energy and sustainability manager, Ron um, Henderson, who's gonna share uh, some of our climate change work that we're doing. Great, thank you, Ali. As uh, Ali mentioned, my name is Ron Henderson. I am the energy and sustainability manager. And I also wanna recognize that uh, Ryan Kindrichuk is our uh, project sustainability project coordinator who uh, works directly with me and the rest of the team and create, uh, collects a lot of the data that you're gonna be hearing about a bit about tonight. So what I'd like to talk a bit about is the climate change projects that we're uh, currently underway. Um, Andres just mentioned off the top a little bit about the climate change action plan. I also want to talk about some of the renewables that we're doing, uh, the Métis Crossing Solar Project, and energy efficiency efforts that we're also doing as part of our uh, work. So at the General Assembly in August of 2017, the unanimously passed uh, the climate change initiatives and basically directed us to take actions at reducing greenhouse gas emissions and increasing Métis involvement and awareness of climate change while creating the capacity and the economic opportunities for Métis citizens. Next. And as Andres noted at the top, we, that has developed into our climate change action plan, which has the five major goals, <coughs> excuse me, uh, greenhouse gas reduction, uh, developing capacity, education and awareness, opportunities for m &A and and its citizens uh, as well. So next. So one of the things that has happened is uh, our climate change action plan has actually been a uh, finalist in this year's Emerald Awards. And those awards will be awarded tomorrow. So hopefully we will be successful and winning an Emerald Award, but it, uh, it's quite an honor just to be nominated for these awards uh, and to be a finalist in the category. So that's uh, recognition from outside parties at the work we're doing. Next. So our climate change action plan goals, we have a number of initiatives that are currently underway. One is renewable energy. We are working to decrease greenhouse gas emissions and produce financial benefits by installing renewable energy projects. Another major pillar is the energy management and energy efficiency. That is making our offices, buildings, and homes more energy efficient and tracking those GHG emissions. We also are very big on citizen engagement. So we are busy providing climate change information to our citizens to our uh, organizations within the Métis Nation, and also sharing that with other groups, Indigenous groups and Métis groups across Canada. And the other thing we do is a lot of advocacy for Métis specific programming. A lot of the um, energy efficiency programs and things are more generic. We are working with governments and funders to make them more specific to the 
unique nature of the Métis Nation and its citizens. Next, please. So the first we have are small scale renewables. And this just shows what we have here. We've got 37 different sites in the province of Alberta where we've installed uh, photovoltaic or solar energy systems. Basically, these ones are pretty well rooftop type uh, systems generating solar and reducing, generating electricity and reducing our costs. So below in the slide is the number of the locations that it is located uh, around the province. And again, there's 37 of them in the small scale category. We're also looking at expanding the small scale and adding more and more sites as we can. Uh, and that is one of the objectives as we move forward. Next slide. This just shows what we're doing for solar production. As you can see back in uh, August of 19, basically we didn't produce anything. We're now working our way up that we're producing up towards 60,000 kilowatt hours per uh, in a specific month. And obviously you can see by the nature of the line here, the lows are December where we don't have a lot of sun and solar to generate. The peaks are up in the uh, sunny time of year, which is the springtime and the summertime. So we're actually generating a fair amount of electricity. So just to, uh, to give you a feel for to date, we've generated around 732 megawatt hours and that offsets about 417 tons of CO2 emissions. And that's about equivalent to taking 128 cars off the road for the year or offsetting the uh, electricity use of about 102 homes in a year. Next slide. This is just an example. This is the uh, Métis Nation head office, the Delia Gray building, showing the solar installation on the roof. Next one. Again, the Larry Desmules building in Edmonton, again, showing the solar uh, both on the roof of the main building and on the shed out back, or the building out back. Next. So that was the small scale solar projects. We, our major project this year is getting the Métis Crossing Solar Project underway. And what we can see here in this picture is this is how the mo that site looked last summer, at the end of last summer, basically uh, a farm field. It has now developed significantly since then. But as we can see by the timeline across the bottom is it's a long process to get to where we're at. Basically, we started with feasibility studies that were begun right after the, uh, the <coughs> sorry, after the uh, writ was dropped and the AGA gave us the direction. And it took a while to get through regulatory approvals, find the financing, do all the design and the engineering and the construction. And uh, through COVID, that did seem challenge to be a challenging in the uh, supply chain issues have affected us somewhat. Uh, but however, we're still looking at anticipated energization and uh, generating uh, electricity to the grid uh, starting late this summer. Next slide. So the Métis Crossing Solar Project is a 4.86 megawatt solar project primarily to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and also to generate economic and community benefits for the partnering communities. So this is a project that is a community benefit. It is the partnership of three companies, but owned by the Métis Nation of Alberta. So Métis Nation of Alberta, the town of Smoky Lake and Smoky Lake County are the partners within this project. Next slide, please. So a portion of the profits that are generated from selling the electricity from this project will allow Métis Nation of Alberta to fund social and economic development initiatives and programs to benefit our citizens. It also will provide tax revenue to the county, uh, create a local development fund, providing additional benefits to the municipal partners, and also result in an emissions reduction of approximately 4,700 tons of CO2 equivalent per year. And that is equivalent to powering 1,200 homes or preserving about 5,500 acres of forest. That is enough to offset all of the electricity that the Métis Nation, its affiliates, and its houses use in a year. So basically what we're doing is we're producing more electricity than we're going to be using. Next slide, please. These are just some pictures of the... Uh, project itself. It is well under uh, construction is well underway. These pictures were taken about three weeks ago. So this is the site uh, as seen from the western side looking east. 
uh, towards the, the other part of the Métis Crossing settlement. Next slide. Again, another slide. This is the first zone of the slide, and you can see in the foreground there, the digger uh, is working on where the uh, main building will be and the roadway coming into the site uh, for that. Next slide. And this is just a total overview of the sort of the three sections of the Métis Solar Project, showing the different stages of construction uh, as we as we progress through this project. Things are really moving along. And since this has been taken, that middle section is completely done now. The uh, All the panels have been installed and we're progressing very quickly on the other areas as well. Next, please. So the last topic I wanted to touch briefly on was energy efficiency. So the energy and uh, energy team has completed energy assist assessments on 337 Métis housing units, including our single family homes, duplexes and others. We've also done ASHRAE level two audits, which are detailed energy audits on 15 offices and other facilities, such as the campground and the Elders Caring Center in Grand Prairie. And energy efficiency retrofits. We've actually gone back in uh, and upgraded the energy efficiency of a number of different sites. So we've done that at six facilities, including the provincial head office and the Tail Creek campground. And with those highlights, I'll turn it back to Allie and she may even have another question for us. Awesome, thanks so much, Ron. Um, yeah, wondering, does anybody have any, any solar panels at home on their roof or maybe any other kind of renewable energy? Maybe thumbs up if you do, thumbs down if you don't. Maybe type in if you have any plans to. But we'll keep things moving here and I will pass it over to Kimberly. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kimberly Mizuki and I'm the environment manager. And um, this is Eliana, she's joining us tonight. Um, so my team includes um, that we have here today. Hi, honey. Um, we have uh, Jack Curry, and they are our, one of our environment coordinators working on our wildlife projects. And we have Rebecca here as well, who is uh, one our summer student assisting with the berry monitoring work that we do. And the rest of my staff are actually out doing the berry monitoring. So that includes Courtney Anderson, one of our environment coordinators, and Tracy Hammer, our data management coordinator. Um, next slide, please, Ali. So a lot of the work that the environment team does is under the ski initiative. NISCI is the Cree word for Earth, and it is our community-based monitoring initiative. We designed this, <clears throat> we designed this project uh, based on engagements with Métis citizens held during 2018, in which we went around to communities and we asked a couple questions. How a Métis-run monitoring program should be carried out, what the main components should be, and then again, we, and then we asked what environmental concerns people had in their region. Next slide, please. So these in these engagements, we heard from citizens um, regarding how we should monitor that they wanted it to be community driven and to have a focus on the transfer and protection of traditional knowledge. Other things that we heard included not duplicating efforts, um, so don't repeat monitoring that someone else was already doing. And then to also um, build partnerships and work with organizations. Slide, please. And then when we asked um, how we should monitor, monitor, what concerns people had and what we should be monitoring, we heard a lot of concerns related to, say, decline in water quality and then decline in wildlife, fish, and traditional plants that are consistent um, factors for our citizens. And then because we were directed to not um, duplicate efforts, we looked at of the concerns that citizens shared, what's already being monitored. And we found that there is a lot of monitoring already done on water quality 
and um, fish health and different wildlife, but there's almost no existing monitoring related tradi to traditional plants. And so while we have launched wildlife and fish health monitoring now, the very first project we launched, which I will talk about, was our traditional plant monitoring. Next slide, please. And lastly, as a ski is community driven, um, we are guided by the ski advisory committee, which is comprised of Métis citizens, um, including community members, a youth representative and an elder um, to provide guidance and advice on the projects and activities. It was formed in 2020 and we try to meet uh, three to four times a year. And I believe one of our members um, was planning to call in today. Um, hi, Cindy, if you're there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I'm just going to go over some of our um, community-based monitoring and knowledge sharing projects that we have. Next slide. And these include traditional plant monitoring, fish health monitoring, and some wildlife related projects. Next slide. So as I mentioned, the first project that we launched and the one that our staff are currently out doing right now is our traditional plant monitoring. And this one seeks to investigate Métis citizen concerns regarding plant health and how environmental and climate factors may be impacting harvested plants. So our staff, uh, sorry about that. Our, um, our staff return to a series of sites twice a year. They go in the spring, which is what they're doing right now, to look at the have of a series of transects. And they go in the spring and they look at the plants that are located within the transect and then select plants. They count the number of flowers present on those plants. And then they return in the summer when the berries have like ripe, have ripened and they count the number of berries from the same plants they count as flowers. By comparing the flowers to the berries, we can understand the reproductive success of the berry plants. And then by compl comparing this data to climate data, we can understand how the reproductive success of berries is being impacted. Next slide. We also do traditional plant walks every year. This is, we've been doing it for three years now. It's an opportunity to share traditional knowledge from our knowledge holder that we work with, Natalie Pepin, and foster cultural connection. Um, these are currently happening. We have one tomorrow in Bonneville, and then um, we will have a couple in July in Grand Prairie and Peace River. Um, they were canceled um, in May due to the wildfires, but we have been able to reschedule them for July. So if you happen to be in those areas, do check out the Inventbrite link that Annalena has shared in the chat. Next slide. And then we also have a series of fish health monitoring programs. Um, one that we do every year is our fish sampling and contaminant testing. We've done that for three years now. Um, this is us, our staff going out with Métis harvesters uh, to do ice fishing on select lakes that we choose based on concerns shared from citizens. We set a gill net and do some rod and reel fishing, and we take measurements and do health assessments of all of the fish that are captured. And then we've also this year and last year been taking samples for toxicology testing. The other side of our fish monitoring is community reporting, where we ask citizens to act as a ski guardians and report on their fishing experience through a series of systems that they can fill out. And Annalena has shared a link to this. So we have three forms. One where you can tell us how your fishing experience went. Uh, share, then the second is to share the measurement and health of the fish you catch. And the final form, for any fish that you've kept and um, consumed, you can share the palatability and even some comments on the internal health of the fish. Um, so that's a great way if you're already out fishing to get involved with monitoring. And if you have concerns about a lake um, or a water source that you regularly visit, a great way to bring it to our attention. And then we use the data from this fishing, um, this fish community monitor to help direct where we could be doing our sampling and contaminant testing the next year. Uh, next okay. slide, please. The other side of our um, the fish health is a series of interviews and knowledge sharing that we've been doing. 
And this is to explore the connection between Métis people and fishing. We're doing this through one-on-one -on -one interviews with harvesters and knowledge holders. And we're hoping to understand um, what Métis citizens use as fish health indicators. We're gonna document and preserve traditional knowledge. And we're gonna be using this data to create a fish health assessment tool that we can then share with citizens. And when people are out fishing and filling out the forms, this can help to create some standardization across the forms that we're working on. Next slide, please. And then the last phase side of our monitoring is our wildlife monitoring. And right now we do have our migratory bird harvest survey that we do in conjunction with Canadian Wildlife Services, where we look at harvesting information. So how many migratory birds our harvesters are harvesting. And this can be used to help guide hunting um, regulations for non-Indigenous harvesters. Um, so it's a great way to inform management and protect Métis harvesting rights. Um, people can get involved if you are out harvesting migratory birds um, at the start of every year. So in January, February, um, we send out, a, we launch a survey that asks about the previous year's fall harvest. So it's a great opportunity to get involved. And if you're already harvesting and you, you follow us on social media, you'll see the survey pull up. Our other wildlife project that is going to be launching this fall is a partnership with iHunter and the Alberta Hunt Log. Where we'll be gathering trip specific harvester information, representation, representation, targets, species, hunting efforts, and success. Next slide, please. And lastly, that we have coming up is really exciting and brand new this year our community bird walk, where you can join our staff mostly Jack, on a guided tour to learn how to listen for and spot birds in your environment. These are coming up in July, so I'm so sorry. Um, so please uh, do um, follow us on social media for details on these. Uh, I'm gonna throw it right back to you, Ali. Thanks, Kimberly and Eliana. Um, always fun to see her pop in. Um, I think Annalena sent a question in the chat about asking if anybody has been fishing yet this year. Um, also, maybe has anybody, did anybody complete the migratory bird survey? I'd love to hear. But moving along, I will pass it over to Jordan, our conservation manager. Hi there, everybody. So I am Jordan York. I am the uh, conservation manager here at the MNA. And uh, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some of our conservation projects. Uh, we are relatively doing this, uh, for, I guess this line of work is a little bit more new compared to some of our environmental monitoring projects, but at the same time, it's new and exciting. And I hope we're doing some really great stuff that you guys will get excited about too. Um, I'm supported by a conservation assistant, Cody Roberts, who's not here today, he's off uh, assistant. I'm joining us here later this month, um, who we've just recruited. So we're we're staffing up to get more capacity to take on more of this work. So it's really exciting. Um, next slide, please. So here are kind of the, the, I guess, initial projects that are really focused on environmental conservation that we've launched and are, are continuously doing here. Um, so we have our Indigenous Protected and Conserved Areas project, which I'll talk a little bit more uh, about next. Native Bee Conservation Program, which hopefully some of you may have seen shared around on social media, and uh, Conservation Land Access Dashboard, which is new and uh, that our new project in development, we're going to be providing a tool to citizens to learn where conservation areas are. Um, collectively, a lot of the focus of the work that we're trying to do is to enable uh, MA citizens to connect with the land, to practice traditions and culture, to connect with the environment, um, and to have opportunities for land stewardship as well. And so um, a lot of this works in tandem with uh, a ski and really addressing a lot of our environmental pillars. And uh, so hopefully we'll be able to continue to do more of that, not only just investigating concerns, but also taking action to go and address some of these concerns as well. Next slide, please. So our Indigenous Protected and Conserved Areas Project. Um, essentially, what is an IPCA? Just to answer that very briefly here, IPCAs are Indigenous-led projects that focus on long-term conservation 
uh, and elevate the the rights and responsibilities of indigenous communities to be able to achieve that. Now they they are a very broadly defined thing, and each indigenous community can actually go and come up with their own definition as long as it still meets a high level criteria. So one indigenous protected and conserved area might look different than another one for another community. So that's kind of complex, but at the same time exciting because the MA community itself can also go and create their own version of what an IPCA would be, which is something that we've been working to do. Next slide, please. So in this case, we engaged the MA community uh, back in, I think it was late 2020, um, on what an MA IPCA should look like. We wanted to understand what the, the values were, the things that citizens would like to see us accomplish, what services they'd maybe like to provide, all of those different things. And so during the pandemic, of course, because uh, you know we had to adopt to online types of engagements, we held some Zoom sessions and we had a survey out there. And I think we engaged with about 500 individuals uh, on what this Indigenous Protected and Conserved Area could look like. Next slide, please. And so going through all the feedback that we got, all the suggestions, the ideas, uh, the engagement data, we were able to really summarize kind of these high level priorities that we should be focusing on trying to accomplish in establishing IPCAs here in Alberta for the MA community. So we have things like ecological protection, which can focus on protection of biodiversity, cultural keystone species like moose and bison, uh, vulnerable species and vulnerable uh, species habitat, like species at risk, for example, providing a harvesting opportunity. So opportunities to go hunting and fishing and uh, gather traditional plants, uh, education and outreach. So not only just protecting the environment, but citizens relatively wanted to be actively involved in learning traditional skills and engaging that landscape and building that, that connection to nature and sharing it within the community and outside the community relationship building, so engaging with other organizations that maybe know how to do this work already, that are specialists and can bring new tools to the table to make sure that we're successful in this work. So that could be government, non-government organizations, uh, you know, universities, uh, industry, anybody that really can bring another perspective and resources to the table to ensure that we were successful. Citizen involvement and access. Mer very much like with our monitoring programs, uh, we heard that citizens wanted to be involved in the work and guide the work that we were doing and have an opportunity to access the lands that we'd be establishing these, these areas in. And so, uh, you know, some citizens didn't necessarily want to drive too, too far. I think it was about 73% of the citizens that engaged in uh, these surveys and, and sessions said that they wouldn't want to drive over 300 kilometers to access the site. So. In this case, one site would be very difficult in meeting the needs of all citizens. And I'll get a little bit more into that afterwards, but for the most part, accessibility was a huge thing. And citizens, of course, want to be involved in stewardship activities, going on the land, being involved in monitoring and helping improve the land and look after it in a, a very, I guess, uh, traditional way. And lastly, healing the land, making sure that that land is uh, brought back to something natural and functioning ecologically and having value that's there as well. So. All these high level values essentially are what are kind of guiding the process of establishing IPCAs here in Alberta now. Next slide, please. So we took those high level priorities and over a course of about a year, we started looking at different properties and trying to find something that would meet some or at least, or I mean all, or at least some of those uh, high level priorities. And so long, or I guess the strategy now to uh, try addressing that is that one individual site can't necessarily meet the needs of all of our citizens. And so the approach that we're taking is that we have to establish a series of sites across the province to make sure that they are accessible and meet those needs of citizens wherever they are. And so to start, we're looking at a pilot project outside of Edmonton uh, where we can manage one individual piece of land and take that to learn to try using that model to develop sites elsewhere. And so just last month, um, we secured a quarter section of land outside of uh, Beaver Hill Lake, so it's just east of Edmonton, uh, where we, we are using this as a pilot site. So it's uh, an opportunity for us to manage that land, come up with stewardship activities, monitor the land, and try figuring out what this IPCA could look like. Um, and in this case, it, it is going to hopefully be 
uh, developed and declared to be an IPCA. At this point, it's just a pilot project and we're moving towards that declaration, but we're really trying to build out what this is going to look like and uh, what we can do moving forward with this. But it's exciting work to get our feet wet and start doing some of this. And that is Cody there, the one who is missing today in the photo, standing up by uh, the pond on that, uh, that site. Next slide, please. So what's going on right now? Well, this is a relatively new parcel of land for us. It's uh, primarily grasses and wetland, and we're really trying to understand what's there to understand how to best manage it. What are the activities that we can have there? What are the opportunities that citizens can be involved in for stewardship? Um, and we're looking at all different kinds of options, but to really understand how to manage it, we really have to take that first step in understanding what's there. So we're doing some baseline monitoring. And even right now today, if you see that my face is a little bit flush, I just came from the site. I was setting up uh, some trail cameras and some audio recording units so that we can get a better idea of what animals are on that site right now. Again, to influence how we'll be managing it. So long term, uh, we're hoping to get a better understanding of what the site can offer, what the potential is, uh, what the activities are that we can get citizens involved with. We'll hope to declare this as an IPCA uh, from within the community and uh, Hopefully afterwards, we'll be able to take this model and use it to apply to other areas to build up more uh, more sites to provide stewardship opportunities to citizens wherever they are across the province. Next slide, please. Now we have our native bee conservation program. Uh, if you guys have been checking out um, some of our social media posts and uh, our newsletter, you might have seen some posts about that this spring. Um, it's a very popular program. It's in our second year. In our first year, we gave out about 240 of these native bee conservation kits. I think we did about 500 of them this year. The way that the program works is that we have signups usually held in uh, April, where we start posting on social media, providing an opportunity for citizens to sign up if they're interested. Then we'll do a random draw for the kits that are available to provide those to citizens. And we'll ship those out, uh, hoping to get them to citizens sometime in May with the hope that they can set up their bee boxes or bee hotels by um, early June at the latest. Uh, the, the kits include a bee hotel, which provides some nesting uh, habitat for a lot of native bee species. And then it also includes some information materials that uh, were created by Edmonton Area Land Trust, really help citizens identify bees and understand how this, uh, this bee hotel would work and how to maintain it. And there's also wildflower seed packs so that they can plant those in their yards to support the native bees so that hopefully there's more success in them actually using the uh, bee, uh, bee hotels. Now, the, the importance of this program is that a lot of native bees are really losing a lot of their habitat. They're being outcompeted by uh, non-native bees like honeybees, which you might be familiar with. And so just by providing some of these bee hotels around the province, particularly in urban areas, especially it creates just kind of little little parcels of habitat essentially to support more of those native bees. They have a place to go. Um, and so after they've set those up, they run them through the summer. They can keep an eye on them and hopefully identify some of the bees that are in there. We'll send all the participants of this program a survey, usually by September, where they can report back to us on whether or not they've had success in bees using their bee hotel as well as whether their wildflowers grew, if the bees were using their wildflowers and uh, more feedback like that. And so we're always kind of keeping an eye on where these, these bee hotels are being set up and if we're seeing success so we can continue monitoring uh, the success of the program. And so if you are interested in getting involved in this, uh, again, I suspect we'll be running something similar again next April. So keep an eye on social media so you guys might get your chance to register for a bee kit. Next slide, please. And lastly, we have this new exciting tool. Uh, so Cody, who isn't here with us today, he was a, uh, a student working on a practical project with us and this was his real focus. And now he's moving it towards launching it, which is really exciting. And so this is the conservation land access dashboard. In this case, it's really trying to address the problem that some citizens may not know where they can go to engage in traditional land use activities like hunting or camping or even just gathering and having a campfire. And so there are some similar tools out there, but really we've been trying to gather information on all the different public and private land sites that are available across Alberta so that wherever our citizens live, they can hop onto this tool and try to figure out where they can go to do some of this work. And so Cody right now is connecting 
did with a series of different organizations like Alberta Conservation Association, Ducks Unlimited Canada, Edmonton Area Land Trust, and, and plenty more to try bringing all that information into one tool. And so you can use that tool, hopefully, once it's launched to figure out, well, maybe you want to go hunting on one site, but you also want to camp there. You could use filters to figure out exactly which sites provide those opportunities for you. And our goal is to launch that by the AGA here this fall in August or late late summer in August. And so hopefully you guys will be hearing a little bit more about this one soon. And I think that's it for me. So I'll pass it back to Allie. Awesome. Thanks, Jordan. Um, thanks for sharing that question in the chat, Annalena. Um, yeah, Kathy just installed the B Hotel. That's awesome. Um, fun fact, I put a bat house out at our family cabin and found a bat in the cabin the other day. So I hope if anybody has any of these houses, the animals, wildlife stays outside, but I did manage to catch it. Um, anyways, moving along here, I will pass it over to Jennifer um, to talk about our engagement and policy team. Hi everyone, um, my name is Jen Pelipu and I'm the Engagement and Policy Manager in our Environment and Climate Change Department. My amazing team is made up of Allie, who you already know now. She's an Engagement Coordinator and Policy Analyst on our team. And then we have Annalena, who's been active in the chat and she's our Engagement Assistant. And then we have Shira, who just joined us as a Summer Student Engagement Assistant. So a lot of rock stars on my team. Um, next slide, please, Ali. So I'm going to just talk to you guys today about a few things that we work on. Uh, we support a lot of the other initiatives that our lovely department does, but I'll just go through a few things here that are a little bit more of our focus. Next slide. All right. So as you heard from the other managers, really everything we do in our department is driven by Métis citizens and is for Métis citizens. So this means that we actually need to go out and engage with Métis citizens. So we need to come and say hi to everyone. So on our team, we kind of have forward-facing priorities and then we kind of have more behind the scenes priorities. So for the forward-facing ones, the focus of our team is really centered around being present in community, meeting citizens, sharing information about the environment and climate, and then just listening to concerns and priorities from our citizens. Um, the more behind the scenes behind the scenes work that we do is then taking all of the things that we learn when we engage with citizens and we use that information to guide our programs and advocate for the rights and priorities of Métis people in Alberta in the environment and climate change space. Um, and that's whether it's within the MNA itself, with um, outside organizations or with other governments. Um, some of the ways that you may see us out in community are behind a booth as you can see here at the various M&A events throughout the year. Um, these pictures are from Métis Fest last summer, uh, the Rupert's Land, Land Alumni event earlier this year, and the most recent Youth and Seniors Gathering. And I think we're gonna throw up a poll or a uh, question in the chat, let you guys see if you've seen us or come chatted with us at any of the booths before. So we will be at um, Métis Fest again this year. That's happening on June 24th. It's gonna be at Métis Crossing, um, as well as the AGA in August, as it was mentioned earlier. So if you guys are joining for any of those events, come find our booth, come say hi and see all the cool stuff that we have planned. Next slide. So another way that our team connected with Métis citizens most recently was through our ski re-engagement sessions that we hosted earlier this year. Um, as Kimberly mentioned earlier, we last engaged with community regarding our ski initiative about five years ago. So it's definitely due for us um, to get out again and really open up the conversation about the environments and climate. Members of our team visited nine locations across the province and we hosted 12 sessions where we invited citizens to come join us for a meal, learn about our programs. And then we did a deep dive into what environmental and climate changes Métis people were seeing in their spaces and in their lives, and then what concerns they might have about these changes that they're noticing. Maybe you guys even joined us for some. Um, we then discussed opportunities to make our programs better and how they can evolve in the future to really best meet the needs of our citizens kind of in this changing space. Next slide. 
So our team has recently presented three opportunities for citizens to get involved in our programs through some contests. Uh, we launched our a ski youth monitor contest in late 2022. We asked m and youth to submit an essay on why they would like to join us out on the ice. Uh, four youth were selected and they spent the week learning traditional ice fishing methods from a really awesome group of harvesters as well as assisting our team with some fish health data collection using the more Western science methods. Um, a, fun, a fun fact about this is we went out in February and it was the coldest week of the year, I think. It was like minus 40. Uh, we were all really chilly and um, we would like pull the fish out of the lake and I'd say within 15 minutes max, they were frozen solid. So it was, it was chilly, but we got it done and um, we had a lot of fun out there. The, the next thing I want to chat about is we launched our a ski coin design contest uh, late last year as well. We invited citizens to submit artwork to be featured on a commemorative coin, which showcased their interpretation of Métis people's connection to the land. And we had 70 submissions of really awesome artwork by Métis people. Um, our a ski committee had a really difficult cat task in judging the submissions and selecting the winners, um, but they they did get it done. They selected six winners, and I think we're going to also share a little link in the chat too if you want to take a look at all the artwork that was chosen um, as the top spots. And the grand prize winning artwork is going to be used to create that commemorative coin and we plan to give that away as a thank you to citizens who take part in our programs in the future. Then our most recent contest asked citizens to share name suggestions for our soon to be energized solar farm, which is out at Métis Crossing. Uh, the suggested names were compiled and presented to the Métis Crossing board, and they'll take all those into consideration and decide the final name. So maybe somebody in this group even suggested some names, which would be cool. Next slide, please, Ali. Um, so emergency preparedness, definitely a topic at the front of everyone's mind right now. Um, our team has been working really hard on how we can support our citizens in the face of a changing climate, which often comes with increased risks of environmental emergencies. Um, earlier this year, we opened up applications for 500 emergency response kits with a priority to those living in rural and remote areas, as well as those who might be facing additional vulnerabilities in the face of an emergency. We had over 1,500 people apply um, definitely showing us that this subject is at the forefront of everyone's mind in the province and especially within our communities. Um, while applications for this program are now closed and all the kits have been claimed and they've all been shipped out to their recipients, this topic is still a priority for our team, especially in the current climate in Alberta. Uh, we're currently working on compiling resources that we can share online about how to handle potential emergencies as well as providing information at community events. So if you are at Métis Fest or at the AGA, um, definitely come say hi to us because we will be having an opportunity um, to receive a kit there. We're gonna be giving away one kit at each of those events. Next slide, please, Ali. All right, so my last slide, I just wanna chat about um, our team is continually sharing information about the environment and climate um, and sharing resources on social media in our bi-weekly newsletter, and of course, our speaker spotlights uh, that can help us all be better stewards of the land and really be equipped with information kind of on all things environment, climate change. So we've shared information about how to enjoy the outdoors responsibly, how to reduce food waste in your home. Uh, we do a yearly Earth Day celebration that encourages Métis people to do a spring cleanup and and go outside and pick up kind of the garbage that's accumulated under the snow. Um, and we do a giveaway with some environmentally friendly options compared to other everyday items. And our speaker spotlight then is where we get to do a bit more of a deep dive on numerous topics, um, such as sustainable fashion, food security, emergency preparedness, and of course tonight's, which is where we can share kind of what we're up to as a team um, with all of our amazing, amazing citizens like we're doing right now. So. With that, uh, thank you guys so much for being here and I will throw it back to Ali.
Awesome. Thanks so much, Jen, and everybody for sharing. Um, you do, I do hear about all the projects we're doing day to day, but man, we are doing quite a few. Um, so we will move along to questions. I know we have quite a few um, that came up throughout the presentation. Um, so we'll maybe just get to those first and start with the ones in the Q&A. Um, I'll just invite everybody from my team to, to jump in here, depending on who the question is best suited for. Um, the first one I'm seeing here is, um, why are all the climate change and environment positions based out of Edmonton? Um, I can answer that. Um, that is where our head office is. And um, over COVID, we were working online. Um, however, we do we do like to see each other and work in person. Um, so that's um, just where our head office is and where their positions are. Um, Andres, I'm not sure if there's anything else you want to add to that. No? Okay. Awesome. Um, sorry, there was one that I think came up. I'm not sure what, what, what we were talking about at 624. The question is from Charmaine asking if this requires a lot of maintenance. Was that a Jen? Cool. Yeah, I think that was about um, the bee nesting boxes. So um, yeah, so we actually shared a really good resource. Um, it's of our story map and it has a ton of information about if you do have your own or how you can make your own or where you want to buy your own bee box if you weren't able to join our program this year and it goes into the maintenance of those boxes and different types of maintenance required there so i would say for me who's someone who like doesn't want to put in a ton of work for these things it's it's pretty low to medium maintenance you just need to do a nice clean of it um at the beginning of spring after your bees have left and before the new bees arrive. But other than that, it's pretty simple and quite nice way to get involved in the outdoors. Right on. Um, next question here. Do we know, is there a booklet on Métis traditions? Anyone want to jump in on that? I can jump in again, Ali. Um, we do, there is a, a book that was recently just written. And I believe that if you are an MA citizen and you do have a card number, you can apply to receive one of those books for free. They'll actually ship you one. So maybe I can just pull up, I'll uh, do a little Google over on the side here and see if I can find that website. And it's a, quite a nice book. I know my mom recently received it and has really enjoyed going through it. So I would say that's probably a good place to start. And then a nice Google will, will get you a lot of places with some really cool books from some lovely authors. Yeah, great. Okay, I will share that with you right now. Right on. Um, I think I have one for Jordan here. What sorts of conservation monitoring thresholds will you be setting for cultural practices such as harvesting of plant and animal species at IPCAs? Will there be wildlife preserve areas within IPCAs? Yeah, I think that's a, an interesting question. I think we're we're still very preliminary in terms of how we're going to be managing each individual site. And each individual site might also have different values that are there need to be managed differently. Um, so some sites, maybe it's a species at risk focus site or something like that, where we need to preserve the habitat a little bit more and can't have as much disturbance, may not have as much opportunity for like more intensive harvesting or even harvesting at all in some cases. Another site could be very much focused on harvesting opportunity and opening things up more similar to the sites offered by like Alberta Conservation Association or Ducks Unlimited, for example. So I think it's gonna be on a site by site basis, um, but those are definitely some considerations that we'll have in mind. And for each site, we might have to consider different models. For example, I think Nature Conservancy of Canada has opportunities right now where you can book individual uh, like hunting trips from their sites. You can book out the site to go and hunting on it which is one model where they offer that. ECA, on the other hand, you can just show up at the site and go hunting there too. So these decisions have to be made for sure. And I think the baseline monitoring that we'll do on these individual sites will help us determine which model we think that we uh, would be most suitable and you know can be done sustainably. Right on, thank you. Um, another great question here. Um, there are only limited numbers of B hotels available. Um, will you receive bee monitoring data from AT citizens who have installed their own bee hotels or planted native species to support bees? I can take that one, Shan. <laughs> um, 
so in this case right now, what we've been doing is we've been sending out a survey only to the participants of uh, our, our B program. So those who have received a kit, who have put it out, uh, they're reporting back on the success of the kits and the things that they're seeing. Um, there might be opportunities for us to expand our monitoring to try getting people to submit data else or elsewhere. Maybe that's something we can consider, but at least through, through the current program, the data that we're collecting is primarily focused on just the participants of the, the uh, program who have received a kit. So um, if you're interested in you know, participating, you didn't get a kit, that's definitely something we can look into. Awesome, hope that answers your question. Um, moving along, um, what do I have to do to join the conservation team? I know the question sounds obvious, but I wanted to know if there are other requirements included. Probably you again, Jordan. So in an official capacity, just keep an eye out for our uh, recruitment um, postings on Indeed and on, on our, our uh, website as well. Um, we actually do have a new post coming up. I think it might even be up now, I'll have to check, but for a conservation coordinator focused on uh, parks related work. So if that's something that interests you and you think you have a, a good background for that one, I mean, please do check it out. Um, other than that, if you're looking at getting involved in a less official way, more so in kind of being involved in stewardship or maybe like volunteer work or helping out with monitoring. At this point, I think we still need to advance some of our work a little bit more forward to figure out what those opportunities are. Uh, so the biggest thing is to stay involved in watching our social media, uh, follow the newsletter, because when those opportunities become available, we'll be sharing them there to let you know that you can get involved um, and reach out to us anytime. I mean, uh, we're always happy to take emails here at, within the team. So uh, environment at environment.mati.org, send it that way if you ever want to just, you know, connect. Awesome. Thanks, Jordan. Um, Brendan, you've had your hand up for a minute there. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah, thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. Brendan Struthers, Region 3. Um, first off, I just wanted to congratulate y'all. This is a pretty big portfolio of work, um, and I don't think this department's existed for that long, so it's or this team, so it's pretty impressive. Um, pretty, pretty diverse set of stuff. My, back, my background's in clean energy, um, and I just kind of wanted to ask a bit more about the energy efficiency work that's being done. You know, I see it's it's very focused on the, you know, MNA's assets, like the buildings and like the, obviously the lower income housing that's there. I'm wondering if there's any work being done to deliver programs to citizens to support energy efficiency in homes, um, particular if y'all have explored um, like working with NRCAN, for example, to deliver drug transfer payments um, from things like greener homes or, um, you know, Nikoiwash is a sector in NRCAN that delivers uh, the Indig Indigenous Natural Resources Partnership Program. So MNS, Métis Nation Saskatchewan and MMF both actually are in the works of doing this, of actually getting transfer payments on an annual basis from the federal government so they can deliver these rebate programs directly to Métis citizens. And they want to do this and there's a need for it, obviously, too. I don't know if anybody's ever tried to access greener homes or any federal program for that matter, but it's a pain in the ass, for lack of a better term. Um, they're not that they're not designed for accessibility. So, uh, yeah, I was just curious if there's any conversations of that, of uh, program delivery on the energy efficiency side, because I know just because uh, the Métis, you know, citizen base is it's so diverse. There's so many people in so many different places. So I think those like delivering programs directly to citizens is something the federal government can't do. And yeah, I'll stop there. I can answer You're this sure? one. I can answer this one, Ali. Uh, th thanks. First of all, thanks, Brendan, for attending and thank you for 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 for, for your words, uh, department. Absolutely. Uh, we we have engaged with Greener Homes. We engage uh, at a national level with something called the Métis Nation Canada Table on Clean Growth and Climate Change. And one of the key pieces that we always bring up is the, the really need for the Métis Nation of Alberta to design and implement programs that best meet the needs for Métis citizens within Alberta. We know Greener Home has a whole bunch of issues and, and there's a whole bunch of other programs that um, and I think there was also another question about why we've kind of focused on, I mean, it's actually been a focus because of the rigidity of the federal funding that is there. It's usually available for, you know, Métis communities or Indigenous communities, which we fit. But, um, you know, we know that 
uh, citizen specific, like like citizen programming is something that that's that's where we want to go. That's really what's going to get us to the goal. And so we we continue to advocate for that. And you know, I, I think I'm happy to kind of say that we're seeing a little bit more movement. And and so what you hear from MNS and, and the MMF, I think it, it's 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 a bit of that movement as well and and so we are engaged in that as well so i uh, and my hope is that you know maybe maybe in the near future we can see some mna specific programming on climate for mna citizens that would be amazing so yes i i agree with what you said and we're working on it awesome that's great to hear thank you Great, thank you. Um, another question, kind of in the similar vein, um, from Deborah. I would like to know why Métis Crossing was chosen as a solar project rather than putting panels on homes of citizens. So, if you want to jump on that again, Andres. Yeah, it, 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 the same. Um, I would say it was the same comment of, for Brendan. It, it, we didn't see it as one or the other. We wanted to do both, and unfortunately, you know. Uh, because we 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 usually seek uh, government fund type of initiatives, we don't we don't have our own sorts of funds. Um, you know, we 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 saw a way to get that for Métis Crossing Solar Project uh, in 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 the citizen programming piece, where we would provide support for M and A citizens so that they can do that in their own homes, whether that's efficiency or solar. Uh, we're working on it still. It, it, it it's something that I think it it just requires a lot more work. Uh, the government's not usually um, used to this type of delivery, and, and we are engaging them to make sure that they're comfortable enough and they understand that this is really what uh, would really meet the needs of Métis citizens best. I, I don't know, if, hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Um, another good question. Um, how do we propose future IPCA areas? Jordan? Yeah, it is a good question. I think we're we're constantly looking right now and trying to figure out, you know, where the next state might potentially be. Um, also still looking for funding in some ways to go and be able to secure more sites and things too. So it's kind of a, a constantly forward looking thing. Um, but we did have engagements before um, asking citizens where they recommended we focus on. I think that we're probably overdue for maybe more engagement on this uh, topic too. Uh, so we'll probably be reaching out in the next while. So again, I would say uh, follow us on social media, the newsletter, when we do engage again, you'll see those opportunities. And then again, to if you wanna just reach out directly about any particular sites that you think should be protected, any opportunities that you see there, uh, feel free to send us an email. Happy to connect with you about that as well. Awesome, thanks Jordan. Another question for IPCAs, um, is how are invasive plants handled there? I think that will depend on the individual invasive plants. And again, we're still learning some of this, but from some of my, uh, I guess, engagements with other conservation organizations, uh, they do handle it different ways. Sometimes they'll use spraying, they'll spray uh, herbicides to control some things. Other ones where they can't do that, if it's too close to a water body or perhaps just not the way that they wanna manage the site. They'll sometimes have individuals come in or individual methods for grazing or perhaps removal. So some uh, some organizations have had volunteers coming out and pulling out, uh, you know, invasive plants just by hand. Other times they might bring in uh, goats to go and graze them like American thistle. I think there's a, an individual that they can hire out to go and bring goats onto a property and graze those and they'll direct them by herding them with dogs so there's a lot of really cool and interesting creative ways to handle invasive uh, plants um and we'll be trying to tackle that with our own sites as well so even right now we just got that site uh over in lamont county there over by beaver hill lake uh we're just trying to understand what's on there we'll probably also identify some invasive plants that we need to deal with and come up with a strategy for that too so we'll uh keep you keep you informed of what our strategies are and what way we decide to go with it. Maybe there'll be some stewardship opportunities there. Awesome, thanks Jordan. Sign me up for the goat and dog day out there. That sounds like fun. A um, few more questions here. Um, another one in the Q&A, following up from the question about um, postings at Edmonton um, and that lots of our conservation initiatives are focused around Edmonton and North Edmonton areas. Considering the prairies are one of the most critically endangered ecosystems on the planet, do you envision branching your offices to the southern region? Anyone want to tackle that? 
I'll, I'll tackle some aspects related to conservation programming, but uh, I won't say whether or not an office will open elsewhere. That's beyond the scope of my, my realm of influence here. But um, I mean, right now, at least for conservation programming, we do have kind of those other programs, higher level things where it is offered to everybody. Like bee kits, for example, any, any citizen across the whole province could access the bee kits and register and potentially get one. We do hope to have other programming that's available and not necessarily Edmonton based. So I, I am hoping that we can create opportunities for citizens to get involved in things regardless of where they are. However, I understand that the first piece of land that we've secured to try developing an IPCA is Edmonton based. And the reason for that again, is that it's a pilot site. Our staff are based out of Edmonton. It's much easier for our staff to go and work on that land when it's readily available. And so, in that sense, it made sense to target Edmonton. However, that doesn't mean that the next one's going to necessarily be there. Um, we will be looking elsewhere. We're also still securing funding to try uh, looking at other lands and secure more lands elsewhere. Long-term planning is to try getting sites across the province. And so it just might take some time to have that happen. Um, so I, I agree. There's definitely a lot of great opportunity down south to look at uh, the uh, native grasslands, for example, and a lot of species at risk. And I'm really hoping we can branch down there at some point. Right on. Um, another IPCA one, I believe um, Charmaine asked, now that we are having, uh, now that we are having our own government in the mix, does anyone know how much they will support this project or are they already playing a part in its growth? I'm assuming that was IPCA, not the solar project. If you want to clarify, Charmaine. Um, I'm, I think it was during while, while you're talking about the, the IPC, okay. Jordan, if you want to continue on. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure. Um, in the IPC, oh, solar, oh, solar project, there we go. I'll pass that oh, back. <laughs> <laughs> I assumed wrong. Andres, um, now that we have our own government in the makes, um, how much uh, they will be supporting the, pro the solar project or, or are they already a part in um, its growth? Sorry, I, I, I don't think I copied the question. Sorry, no worries. In the chat here from Charmaine, um, now that we have our own government in the mix, does anyone know how much they will support this project or are they already playing a part in its growth? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I, I think there is support for this project for sure. Like that's why we moved uh, ahead with it. I think, you know, looking forward, one of the things that when, when we look at that AGA resolution, for instance, that the citizens have directed the MNA to fulfill, um, there is, you know, reducing GHG emissions, it really doesn't have a, a, a limit. It doesn't say just do one project. So I think we'll continue to recommend a staff to leadership, uh, more projects. Uh, it, it really kind of does align very well with some of the goals uh, that that resolution has directed the MA to achieve. So I, I would say um, from my perspective as staff, we'll continue to look for more opportunities to offset uh, our consumption. Like I, I think Ron actually mentioned that five megawatts is, I guess at, at a, at a MA government level is what would offset our electricity consumption. Uh, Maybe maybe another twenty megawatts, maybe another one hundred. We don't know yet. I think we're we're still looking for more opportunities, and we will recommend those to our leadership once once those show up. Awesome, thank you. Um, thanks so much for all the great questions rolling in. Um, this is awesome. I, so, Ali, I think I, I we may have missed a question from Chris, and I think there was one asking about harvesting rights in the South. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, um, yeah no worries. Yeah, I have so too much says, screens open. You got that? So, yeah, yeah. So it says, will harvesting rights become available in, in, in areas surrounding Calgary? So I'm, I'm happy to take this question. So the, uh, so the advocacy of Métis rights in the South is not something that my department does specifically. I, I know that when their harvesting policy was negotiated with Alberta, there was a commitment of the government of Alberta to continue to look for that piece. Um, unfortunately, I know it hasn't really moved, but I know that my colleagues within the MNA are working on that as well. But um, so I, I wanted to say that 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 work is ongoing. 
Awesome. Hope that answers that question. Um, another one here about policy. Um, how does the MA policy on climate change relate to the national Metis policy, or does it? Maybe Jen, you want to jump in there? Sure, I can pop in here. Um, so our, our climate strategy has, um, as you saw, our climate change action plan. So that's kind of where we pull our main strategy right now. Um, the Métis National Council currently doesn't have an official strategy. I think we all have the same things in mind where we're all working to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and increase um, our citizens' ability to work through this transition, this green transition, as well as protect our environment and conserve our land. So really, we've all got kind of the same base of what we're trying to work for. Um, we are in talks with other governing members and MNC, and we're hoping to work towards creating a strategy altogether. Um, so I guess stay tuned for that. But I would say we all have the same you know, priorities at the end of the day. Um, when it comes to the policy and of climate policy and yeah maybe i'll throw to andres too if he has anything to add yeah I, so i think the question was kind of how does our kind of actions or programs and issues relate at a national level and you know I, I, it, it just like us we're pretty new department i would say some of the some of the departments uh, uh mnbc mns and mno as well are pretty new. Uh, having said that, we 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 are collaborating quite actively. And actually, as a matter of fact, a few a few weeks ago, we were in Ottawa sharing some information about the work that we're doing, and we're actually uh, surprised at the amount of uh, alignment that there was in terms of priorities. Right, like you know, the mitigation side that Jen's uh, mentioned, but also the conservation emphasis, the focus on jobs emergency preparedness uh, just re resoundingly across across the nation is something that you know it was 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 a priority um yeah so i think you know it's um it 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 we we've kind of done our own thing uh, but we are seeing a lot of alignment as as yeah. as the other governing members have done and and what we're finding is that we are so aligned and i guess you know it kind of comes as a as a reflection to the one community piece, right? Like it, the values are very, very similar across the nation. <clears throat> Great, thanks, Andres and Jen. A um, couple more questions, and then maybe we'll have time for one or two after that. Um, so from Wayne, um, would a program for assisting citizens to develop sustainable perennial plants, like fruits, vegetables, berries, um, as well as other plants, um, is that? on the horizon at all. Um, Kimberly, do you want to jump in on that? Um, sure, and I think that also relates to Andrew's question that's also in the chat asking about um, food security and um, encouraging citizens to garden. And you mentioned the food sovereignty presentation with Natalie Pepin. Um, what we um, are actually currently working on, we heard in RSV re-engagements a lot of people concerned about the rising cost of food and concerns over food sovereignty and food security. And so we heard that and we are actually working with Natalie Pepin to um, film a series of talks on um, how to how to garden essentially. Um, so we're going to help citizens um, to get their gardens growing. So we're working on that project right now, and we're going to look at other ways that we can help um, citizens to share information, but also to share resources um, with citizens, even if it's just um, you know different ways to build deep garden boxes or to garden in small spaces. Say if you live in um, an apartment and you're limited to just some balcony um, space. So that is something that we're actively working on um, to, to help empower citizens to grow their own food and uh, be more um, independent in that way. Maybe I'll just wow. jump in as well. So yeah, because the, the food security piece has come up quite a bit specifically in the last couple of years. And I know a lot of the work that we do is to identify the need and then identify the resources to meet that need. And I think that's where we're at right now. We, we've heard loud and clear 
that it is a priority, it is a need, it makes sense to have it. Our work as staff is to figure out what type of resources do we have to line up to make sure that we can meet that need. And that's kind of where we're at right now, is what I would say. Awesome, thank you. Um, maybe we have time for one more question if anybody has one. I don't see any coming in. Um, so I guess I'll just say thank you to everybody who took a moment, uh, took some time out of their evening to join tonight. Um, it is really great to see some, some familiar faces, the names, maybe a few family members here tuning in. That's great. Um, yeah, I hope everybody learned something, um, got a bit of an overview of all the work we're doing. Um, and we'll be around lots this summer, as we mentioned. So please stop by and say hi. Um, always great to hear hear from, from folks. And, and really, most of the work we do is based off citizen feedback. So please, it's great to, to hear all these questions um, and come chat with us. Um, that's 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 how these things, how these things happen lots of the time. Um, and with that in mind, I will be sending a little follow-up survey in the next few days, along with all of the many links we shared tonight. Um, and in that follow-up survey, if you're an M&A citizen, you can win a $100 Visa gift card um, and like share ideas for future um, spotlight sessions um, or any ideas or questions you had after this. Um, that would be great. So you'll see, expect that in your inbox in the next few days, along with the link to this recording, if you want to pass it along to anybody else. Um, also, I think we shared a link from all of our previous spotlights. They are on our website. We've had several now, um, and they've been, they've been really great. Um, so thanks again for everybody who's joined us tonight. And um, I can't believe we made it on schedule. We were set for 6 to 7.30, and we really did it. So um, thanks again for joining. Um, please, I think as we've mentioned, um, reach out if you have any questions. Keep an eye on social media. That's where we post lots of our activities and stuff. So um, thank you and, and take care. Have a great night.